church. We are redeemed and chosen, trusting in the God of love, the God of hope, the God of atonement. We are church. We believe in one way, one truth, one life. Devoted, eyes fixed on the prize. Devoted to Christ. We are church. We put God first. We are like-minded people created in Christ for good works. Made in the image of greatness, made to reflect the greatest love ever known. We are church, the light in the dark, the hope to the hopeless, a brand new start. Peace for the broken heart, a love that has open arms. We are church, not four walls. We are a body of believers following the call The call to know we are forgiven The call to love without condition The call to trust without division We are church A community with open doors Serving the poor, living for more We are broken people with a united cause An unbroken love and a divided society Proclaiming Jesus is Lord This is what we do We don't judge we don't hold a grudge, we are not perfect, but we aspire to love. We are church. Good morning, Radiant Church. My name is Andy Lynn. For those of you that don't know me, I have the pleasure of being the next gen director for the state of New Jersey. So all that means is zero through college. Uh, my heart is that every church in New Jersey would have a healthy kids ministry, a healthy youth ministry, healthy young adults, and that every family in New Jersey and our churches are equipped to make disciples in their own home. We're in the beginning stages of this journey, but we're so excited for the future. And we believe there's a harvest in New Jersey and that God's going to use the next generation and our families to be at the center of it. So we're so excited. But when Pastor Marcus called me and asked if I would preach this week, I got so excited. I was with y'all about two years ago and y'all honored my family. Y'all are so hospitable. The bagels were amazing and uh, I couldn't resist. So he told me about the series that y'all are in. God is. And we're going to be in today in John chapter 11. If you want to go ahead and turn there and the title I have for today, you're going to see slides kind of come up over me uh, as, as we speak with the verses. But I, I picked the title, Don't Miss Who God Is. So it can be really easy to miss things. And it happens to all of us. Sometimes we miss opportunities or jobs. And a couple of my favorite stories uh, of people missing things is the first one was with Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, they asked him, Hey, what was one of your biggest missed opportunities? And he said, I missed it like crazy. He said that Starbucks came to him. This is a true story. When they were first getting started, they just had a handful of stores and they said, we really need a celebrity to back us, but we don't have money to pay you. So we'll give you a percentage of our company. If you'll be our spokesperson, he just had to do a few commercials, uh, get some pictures taken and he said, hey, man, your coffee's too expensive. No one's going to pay five bucks for a cup of coffee. Well, if he had said yes, he would be a major stakeholder in Starbucks, billions of dollars just for shooting some commercials, uh, shaking some hands, taking some pictures. And another one, uh, which is kind of near and dear to all of our hearts that are over 30. How many of you remember going to a Blockbuster? Anybody? Uh, I used to love them. The be kind, please rewind, right? Uh, we had to rewind VHSs, rent out DVDs, all these things. Well, during the late 90s, uh, Netflix had started, but they weren't online. They were sending DVD catalogs to your house, and you would watch the DVD and send it back and go back and forth. Well, they were about to go bankrupt, and they said, hey, Blockbuster, will you purchase us for a really cheap price? Uh, we're going under and Blockbuster said, man, we're not giving up our retail stores. People love our retail stores. And so they chose not to even buy Netflix. Well, Netflix was able to get some more money and not just did they, so they didn't just survive. Uh, obviously, Blockbuster isn't here anymore. <laughs> so all of us have a, 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 an opportunity to miss things. It's really easy when we go into scenarios with this is how it works. This is how a relationship's going to work. 
and then we get disappointed. This is how God is going to love me. And then we're like, I don't think God loves me. So often we can miss things about God, not because he's not loving or present or pursuing us, but we miss it because we're expecting it to happen a certain way or filtering it through what we think we need. Sometimes we look at something in society or in our world and we ask the question, why doesn't God do something about that? We see starvation or disease or some awful tragedy or some terrible issue in the human heart. I like, mean, why doesn't God do something about that? If we miss who God is, we will ask questions like that. And if you're struggling today with the idea of being fully loved by God, no matter what, I'm so glad you're listening and on this live stream today. Uh, we're going to read, as I said, in John chapter 11. Let's go ahead and pray over that passage. Lord, I pray over John 11, God, as we read it, that these words would jump off the pages and into our hearts. Like, God, this would not just be a story that we've heard over and over. But, Father, may we feel your presence and love just like those original readers and those people in the story experienced it. God, I pray that your word would become real to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we turn there, uh, you're going to see in John chapter 11, uh, verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany. It was the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. It was their brother, Lazarus, who was ill. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. So uh, they did not have text messages or phone calls back then. So Mary and Martha are over here and they say, hey, send a messenger to Jesus over here and tell him the one whom you love is sick. If this was written nowadays, it would say, hey, Jesus, your best friend is sick. And uh, Jesus says, hey, he tells the messenger, hey, go back, tell Mary and Martha, this is not going to end in death, but it's going to end in the glory of God. They're going to experience God's glory. It's going to be great. So Jesus does that. He tells them the messenger goes back. And then in verse five, it's pretty bold. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now, what's weird about this is two times in five verses, we're told how much Jesus loves this family. The author, John here, is trying to make sure we understand he's about to do something that doesn't look like he loved them. But twice, John is saying, oh, he loved them. Quite possibly, he was the closest to this family uh, maybe even closer than the disciples, probably the handful of human beings that he was closest to as a human during his earthly time are the, or is this family. And what's wild is in verse six, it says, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place that he was. He hears that Lazarus was ill. And just to be clear, he does nothing. Jesus loves them. So therefore, he does nothing. If you've ever felt like you are praying and Jesus just is not picking up the phone or you are interceding and like going after it and you're like, it just, I don't sense that, that Jesus is here with me. You're not alone. Mary and Martha are absolutely, they send a messenger. The messenger comes back and says, hey, it's not going to end in death. But just to be clear, Lazarus was really suffering. Lazarus really dies. And meanwhile, Jesus at this point in his ministry has healed people by merely saying a word and not being with them. So Jesus has the ability to heal his friend and not move from where they are. He can literally just say, Lazarus be healed and Lazarus will be healed. But he allows his friends to die, his other friends to mourn because he loves them. And you may be sitting here thinking, Andy, this is not what I needed this morning. I did not need to hear that God loves me, so he allows suffering. But just hold on just a second. So uh, I'm a dad. I have a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, a 1.5-year-old, and my wife is pregnant with our fourth. It's a really cool season of our life. We're so blessed. 
And what I've known is my kids feel loved when I buy them ice cream and candy and they think what they need, right, is their biggest need is the next fun time with dad. Their biggest need is ice cream or candy, etc. But really, as their dad, I see a bigger need physically. I see that they need good sleep. I see that they need vitamins. I see that they need to eat good food, all of these things. So as a loving father, I give them what they need most. I don't necessarily give them what they think they need. So here in this story, really simply, Mary and Martha think what they need most is their brother to be healed. I'm going to keep reading right here. Our friend Lazarus, this is verse 11. This is Jesus and the disciples. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, just let him rest. He'll recover. And they, it says in verse 13, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant he was resting. And Jesus is like, no, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I rejoice that I was not there so that you may believe. Let us go to him. Now, if you're the disciples, this is kind of crazy. You're probably sitting there thinking, Lazarus and Jesus are tight. They're best friends. And he let his best friend die to teach us a lesson right here. Man, if we get sick, we are done. We have no shot if Jesus is healing us, right? Uh, and so it says, Jesus has let us go to him. And in verse 17, it says, when Jesus came, Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, just a little Bible nerd fact for you. In Bible times, um, in ancient times, they believed that somebody could possibly be resurrected from the dead after three days, but it was impossible, even for the Lord, really, to, to resurrect somebody uh, after four days, because in four days, uh, the human body starts to decompose at a pretty alarming rate, uh, and uh, they said there was just no hope at that point. So it's pretty intentional on the Lord's part. And just to be clear here, just to get all the facts, Mary and Martha haven't read this story. They're mourning because their brother died. They think Jesus doesn't care about them because they know he has the power to heal. Lazarus really suffered, hoping he would just get healed by Jesus, but he didn't. And so how can we say things like God is love when he lets his best friend die? How can we say that God is love or that God is caring, or that God is all of these things, when he allows atrocities and tragedies in our societies, natural disasters, tragic things, loss of a parent, just all of these different tragedies that all of us walk through. How can we say that God is all of these great things when all of these bad things happen? And these are the questions that all of us kind of go through. And we can start to question what exactly is going on with God's love language. I just don't, I don't feel like I'm loved. And, um, I do a lot of premarital counseling. And one of the things we go through, uh, is love languages. Does anybody here, uh, watching this ever gone through love languages, maybe in, in your house together? And the idea of love languages, you'll see them here on the screen is really simple. It's words of affirmation is one type of love language. And the idea is some people feel loved when you uh, say nice things, when you encourage them. Some people love gifts. Some people feel loved when they get the right gift. Some people feel loved by acts of service. Others feel loved by spending quality time and others feel loved by physical touch. And so this was, this is made for marriage. It's not super scientific, not necessarily biblical, but I want you to hear this real quick. So the, the idea of when a couple is married is that there is sometimes this friction because one of the spouses is loving them in a love language that they don't get. So one of them is saying nice things. I love you all the time. The other doesn't say that their physical touch, but they're trying to hug them and cuddle all the time. And neither of them feels loved by each other, but both of them are trying to love each other. And there's this tension. And a lot of my marital counseling that we do is helping couples understand, hey, you both love each other. You're going to have to learn to say words of affirmation to help them. You're going to have to learn to, to, to accept and give physical touch to help them. And that's just a really simple example. Just to be transparent about how we can miss love languages, when I first got married, I never heard of love languages. It would have saved me so much effort and strife in my marriage. But in our first year, my wife meticulously uh, heard me mention things throughout the year that I liked, and she saved up her money on her own and got me these certain gifts 
throughout the year. So at Christmas time, she presented them. She was so excited. And uh, I liked them. Like, I was like, oh, cool. I do remember saying I liked that and different things. Well, the next day, uh, she went to work and I was off. And I said, you know what? I don't really need some of these things. So I ended up returning them to the store, but not just a couple of them. I ended up returning all of them to a couple stores. And a, a day or two later, she said, hey, do you want to play that board game I got you? And I was like, oh, I returned it. I got a pair of gloves I needed. Oh, do you want to watch that movie? Oh, I returned that too. And all of a sudden, it got cold in my house. And uh, it, it took us a couple days and a couple weeks to figure out everything. But I am physical touch and quality time. She was more gifts, not big gifts, but small gifts. So she tried to love me the way she gets loved. And uh, I tried to love her the way I was loved and did not think that returning gifts would offend her by the way I have learned. I am not a complete idiot. But bottom line, as humans, it happens all the time. We misinterpret how each other feels and how we love each other. Meanwhile, my encouragement here is that God is trying to tell us that he loves us, but you and I maybe, just maybe, aren't getting it. All right. But with that said, this morning, just think about it for a second. Do you feel loved by God and why? Do you feel loved by God and why? If we misunderstand how God loves us, if we misunderstand just for, for, for this conversation, if we misunderstand God's love language, we can go on thinking like a religion. I'm going to do this. I don't sense that God really cares about me, but we're going to do this. We're going to keep going. Or maybe you're like, hey, I, I need to pause. I, I need to know that God loves me. And we can ask questions like, why doesn't God do something about this? So let's see how Jesus interacts with the family that he's closest to when they're dealing with this question. Verse 18, it says this, Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Now, notice normally, what does Mary do? Mary's running to Jesus. Why isn't she running to Jesus? She mad. She real mad. And because she knows Jesus just has to speak the word, but he didn't. In verse 21, Martha comes to Jesus and says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. And Jesus stops her in verse 25. And he says one of the I am statements. I, I picked this passage because if we're going to talk about who God is, Let's let God uh, answer one of the questions. So Jesus here is going to tell us a little glimpse of who he is. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ and that you are coming into the world. She's saying, yes, I believe one day you're going to do this. And Jesus is like, no, 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 I'm not just the resurrection in the future tense. I'm the resurrection in the present tense. Jesus doesn't just make bad people better in the future. Jesus takes dead people and makes us alive. Jesus doesn't just give us life and life more abundantly when we're in heaven. Jesus gives us life and life more abundantly it starts right here. Eternity starts now. The second we are born again and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I repent. I need you as a savior. Eternity starts and life can be more abundant. And Jesus is trying to get her to see this. And uh, there's a simple statement. You're going to see it on the screen. God loves us by giving us what we need the most. What do you think today you need the most? What, what do you think you need the most? Do you think, Andy, I feel alone. I need more friends. I want to meet someone. Do you feel, Andy, it's finances? It's a sickness. I need a healing. Maybe it's like Mary and Martha. Uh, fill in the blank. I need an opportunity. Uh, I need friendships. I need provision. Uh, whatever it is, it can be really tempting to think that we need one of those things. 
But what you and I need most, what Mary and Martha needed most, was not a healing, was not provision. What they needed most was the presence of God. It, it can sound crazy, but God sees your biggest need as experiencing the presence and the glory of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is our biggest need. So when God looks at us and says, they think they need more finances right now. They think they need more of this. What they need is to experience my presence. Now, there's a tension there because as I say this, I'm not in the room with you. But I know as I study this for the first time, what went through my mind is, yeah, yeah, I know I know, I need God's presence, but I really need this healing. I know I need God's presence, but I really do need finances. There's something that God is trying to show us as a loving father. It, we can just like Mary and Martha, be stuck in a spot that we think what we need is this and that, that we need God to do something for us, that we feel loved when God does this. But God's love language to us is really simple. He sees us and says, I created them in the beginning of the world to be in my presence. You and I are not human beings having a spiritual experience. You and I are spiritual beings having a human experience. Our biggest need is that we were made to be in the presence of God. We were made to live on, be breathed on, to, to experience, to be fulfilled by the presence of God. And over the years, as we've grown up in this sinful world, we can begin to think, and we eat spiritual junk food, and we begin to think, well, I know I need God, but I need this, and I need this, and I need that. And what happens just in a pure diet sense, I can be filled with junk food and still be malnourished. I can eat Doritos and Mountain Dew and all these crazy, terrible things for me, and I can feel full, but actually be pretty sick physically. Sometimes we get so much spiritual junk food from stuff that, whether it's stuff online, whether it's, uh, I'm going to read this book, I'm going to go to this conference, I'm going to do all of these things. And we check the boxes off of, I feel good versus am I realizing every morning when I get up, the only thing I need is the presence of God. And what's crazy is when Jesus came to earth, he gave us the very thing that we need the most. It's him. What we need the most is Jesus and his presence. And here, picture if you're Jesus, just for a second, and that's weird to say, but Jesus has come to earth. He has the very thing that his favorite people need, him. He is the resurrection. He is the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, whether you believe it or not. Jesus is not the politically correct way. Jesus is not always the easiest way, but Jesus is the only way. And Jesus shows up on the scene. He's ready to give the people what they want. Remember what he tells the disciples in a few previous verses. He says, for your sake, I am glad that my best friend died because what you need is to experience me, my glory. I get a little excited about this, but that term glory, right? When we say God's glory, what that means is really simply the glory is the reality of who someone is. If I want to experience the glory of Pastor Marcus playing basketball, I have to go there and see him play basketball and be like, oh, wow, did you see that? That was amazing. I get to experience his glory. When I experience the glory of God, it means I get to realize a little bit more of who is God, who is the Lord. And Jesus is telling the disciples, you see me as a rabbi. You see me as a good teacher. What you need is to experience that I am God, that I am love, that I love you, that I'm giving you my presence. And for your sake, I'm glad that suffering happened because what you need the most is not to avoid suffering. What you need the most is to experience my presence. Do you think this morning the biggest thing that you need is God's presence? Think about that for a second. Is the biggest thing you need God's presence? Even if you don't believe that it is, can I encourage you that it is? And that we need to learn to surrender those other things. Experience God's presence. Let's just keep reading really quick. So at this point, Mary comes out. It's verse 32. It says, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, sounds just like Martha, right? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. And this is one of the most famous verses, verse 35. It says, Jesus wept. Why do you think Jesus cried if he knew Lazarus was coming back? A, a lot of people here at this next verse, it says in verse 36, so the Jews said, look how much he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? So a lot of times we think Jesus wept because he was sad for Lazarus. Can I be honest with you? When I when you dig into the Greek and Aramaic, just a little bit right there, what some scholars say, it's super interesting. Uh, they don't think he cried because he was sad. Deeply troubled and moved can also mean very angry. So most scholars actually think Jesus was really angry, that he was angry and moved to tears. Why? He's with the people, the disciples. He's with these Jews are mourning and crying out loud. Martha and Mary are mad at him, and they don't realize it. They don't need Jesus to do a healing. What they need is right in front of them. What they need is God in the flesh. What they need is God's presence, and they have it, and they've totally missed it. They've missed who God is, and he's right in front of them. And Jesus says, I am the life. I am the resurrection. If you feel far from God this morning, could I encourage you that the biggest needs you have in life has already been met, and you can spend time with them today. The biggest need you have is not provision, it's not a healing, it's not another opportunity, it's Jesus in the flesh. It's forgiveness of your sins through the presence of the Almighty God. It's John 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and God did that. And I think Jesus weeps here because he weeps because he wants people to get who he is because that's what you and I need. It's why we were created. So in verse 30, 38, uh, Jesus deeply moved again, comes to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, being the practical one, says, hey, Lord, by this time, it's going to smell. There's going to be an odor. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? If you believe, you'll get to experience who I really am. Verse 41, so they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes. Now listen to this prayer. It's super interesting. Jesus says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I knew that you always hear me. But I say this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. So the prayer is really like, hey, God, I'm talking to you up there, Father, because they need to know that you and I are connected, that you and I are one. And I am saying this on their account. Uh, by the way, can you let Lazarus out of the tomb? <laughs> and it's this crazy moment. And Jesus is just trying to help the entire audience connect the dots. It's not a Messiah that's going to bring back control over Rome and take back Jerusalem and Israel. It's a Messiah that is God incarnate, come to free them from their sin and they, he, what, what humans need, what you and I need more than anything is to experience the presence and the glory of God. Now, I want to leave you with these. Just You'll see three points on the slide right here. It says, what do we do with this truth? And so everybody at Radiant Church that's watching this, if I could just encourage you, Jesus loves you this morning. God is what you need the most. God is what you need the most. I know I started off today and said, don't miss who God is, but I kind of wanted a little uh, anticipation there. But God is what you need the most. Even if you don't feel like he is, that doesn't mean that he's not what you need the most. So I, I would encourage you, maybe spend some time in prayer today and say, Lord, I don't feel like I need you like that. Lord, could you remind my heart, remind my spirit of my need for you? Number two, what is keeping me from resting in his completed work? My big, uh, what number two, what is keeping me from resting in his completed work? Um, has my biggest need been met? 
a lot of us are stuck in this striving and like it's a little bit of a religious sense of like I'm trying to earn I'm trying to do this It'll, life will be better when if I can encourage you imagine waking up every day realizing my biggest need is I was separated from God and you realize because of Jesus and his glory now I'm not I'm no longer separated Lord I pray for any unhealthy worldview God for anything that needs to be unlearned God would the people of Radiant Church be so refreshed in your presence would they be known for people of your presence God would they experience your glory and God would would hundreds with thousands more experience your glory through the work you're doing with Pastor Marcus and Radiant Church and last but not least number three our success our growth is a byproduct of being in the presence of Jesus Make your number one goal goal not to grow or be successful, but to be with Jesus. That's what you and I need the most. Jesus loves us by giving us what we need the most. Who is God? It's what you and I need the most. You and I need his presence more than anything. Well, I absolutely have loved being with you guys digitally. Uh, you're such a, was, again, we had such a blast last time we were there in person. And uh, I'm going to digitally hug all you guys and, uh, and high-five you. And I hope you have a great Sunday. I look forward to uh, seeing you guys again in person. And I'm sure next week is going to be awesome at Radiant Church. Don't miss it. God bless.